Hi, uh, we're back for the second part of our uh, discussion on uh, radicalization with uh, uh, Peter Newman, the director of the International Center for the Study of Radicalization. Uh, hi again, Peter. Hi, David. Well, let's talk a bit about uh, some of the things you mentioned with al was really uh, communicating mostly online uh, uh, with these individuals. Um, uh, it's all the rage uh, these days, especially since Boston, to talk about so-called online uh, recruitment. Uh, you know, when I talk about the uh, uh, this, uh, not uh, recruitment, online radicalization, uh, you know, when I talk about this, sometimes I say, well, if you go back to the colonial times, then uh, they, uh, the Washington and Jefferson, they must have been uh, printing press uh, uh, radicalization. And uh, in the 60s and 70s, maybe fax machine uh, radicalization. I mean, the fact of the matter is that people are going to communicate through whatever the dominant communications vehicle is of that era, and uh, the internet, of course, uh, is that today. Uh, nonetheless, you know, have, do you see that uh, there are some aspects of the internet that are, make it different from other uh, communications vehicles that uh, lend itself? Uh, to you know something different and unique about what what we call online radicalization. Yeah. No, I mean that's another very important and big issue, and maybe maybe um, we kind of slightly disagree here, uh, uh, David. I, I, I will give you um, I'll give you at least two. Maybe if I can think of a third, I'll give you three. Um, three reasons why. Always got to be three, right? Exactly. Uh, why the internet is different. I mean the first one. And, uh, and a very important one is um, audio and video. Uh, I think that's, that's a very important element. If you, if you look at uh, the testimonies and statements by people who've been convicted of terrorism offenses, if you look at what they say in court when they speak about their radicalization, almost all of them talk about video they've seen on YouTube or in online extremist forums that really shocked them, that created that sense of moral outrage that Mark Sageman was talking about in his, uh, in his 2004 book. And the truth is that these are often pictures from war zones, from battlefronts that you simply do not see on TV, that are produced often by insurgent organizations precisely with the intention to shock people. And uh, that has an impact on people. And, before the internet, there was no way you could have gotten hold of these videos. And in fact, there's an interesting anecdote. I've forgotten who, who dug it out, but um, in the 1990s in London, um, Chechnya was a big issue for, for extremists there. And you wonder, why, is there, why, why do people worry about Chechnya in London in the 1990s? They are mostly of Pakistani descent. They live in a Western country. Why is Chechnya such a big issue? And the answer to that is that uh, Ibn Khattab, who was the leader of the foreign fighters in Chechnya, was the first uh, Islamist radical to start filming every operation they carried out. And he was producing these films and sending them back uh, to Western countries. And in all the radical bookshops in London in the 1990s, you could buy video cassettes from Chechnya, but not from any of the other battlefronts. So the people who were interested in that kind of ideology were watching a lot of stuff from Chechnya, brutal scenes, terrible atrocities happening that you could never see on TV. And that's, what they, that's why they got so animated about Chechnya. Obviously today you have all of that on the internet at the tip of, uh, at the, tip of the finger. And I think that has, has a profound impact on people that they can see on the internet. That's point number one. Point number two is, the difference to the printing press and to the fax machine is the internet is interactive. It's not a one-way communication. It actually creates community. You can now go online and you can be part of an online extremist community which actually functions like a community. You can hang out there for 10, 12, 15 hours, talk to people, chat to people, and have a sense of, of, or build a sense of loyalty and friendship to other people that you cannot build through a fax machine or through a printing press. That's the difference. And I, I give you one example from a case where I served as an expert witness in, in London two years ago. This was a guy who wanted to, who presumably wanted to go to Iraq and blow himself up and who was stopped and arrested 
and he was someone who was almost exclusively radicalized on the internet. On the day of his arrest, if you had asked him, who are your best friends, he would have given you five names of people he had never met in his entire life, he only interacted with online, whose real names he didn't even know because he only knew their screen names online. But he would have honestly, sincerely considered those people to be his best friends. These are people that he had interacted with 10 hours a day for almost two years. And it's hard for people our age, David, to understand that. Um, but, but this is where the internet is. They are real communities. They are actual places, albeit virtual places, where people interact and build relationships uh, on. And I think that's almost, uh, that is the real game changer uh, in terms of the internet, that you can actually experience community and build very strong relationships with people. And because that's so important, I leave it with two points. But probably after the end, after the end of this call, I'll, I'll be thinking of a third really powerful point. But these are really things where I think the internet adds something or makes something different. I mean, a third point that you could probably mention is that the internet reduces the threshold, reduces the risk. If you want to, if you're already radicalized and you want to connect to a group, um, because it is relatively anonymous. As we now know, it's not completely anonymous, but it reduces the threshold for reaching out and connecting to other people. So if I wanted to join Al-Qaeda today, you know, sitting in D.C., I would not know how to go about that. I would not know where to go. The truth is, if I went to the next mosque and asked, um, can I please join Al-Qaeda, the chances of me being reported to the police would probably be greater, much greater, than me being able to join Al-Qaeda. But on the internet, I can actually poke around and search around and ask a lot of people without a lot of risk being attached to that. And there may be a small chance, but still a higher chance of actually connecting with someone who is actually a violent extremist than if I just went out and started asking people for Al-Qaeda in mosques in Northern Virginia or in DC. So the ability to connect to people in faraway places, to find things at a low risk to yourself is also something that the internet has facilitated. And by the way, all these functions that I just enumerated are true for terrorism, but they are also true for all sorts of other things. You know, the fact that 20% of marriages that happen in the United States today uh, have started on the internet is something new. It's something genuinely new. Uh, it's something that the internet has facilitated, and so the internet changes our lives. And it would be it would be odd if it wasn't also changing the behavior of terrorists, because terrorists are human beings too. So I, I when I whenever I talk about online radicalization, I'm saying this is nothing exceptional. It is ex exceptional only in the sense that that terrorists are using the internet to carry out acts of violence, but the internet is changing all, our, all of our lives and in the same, in same ways that it has changed your life and my life in many respects, it also does the same for terror. Of course, it's also letting students uh, take this course, which wouldn't have been possible uh, 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 even a couple of years ago. Uh, I think what's interesting is uh, what you talked about online radicalization, how it related to your initial discussion of, of the different elements. Uh, uh, you know, you talked about the, the group dynamics as being an important part, and, and what the Internet has done really is it's made it easier to have those group dynamics in places where the groups of possible fellow radicalizers aren't really uh, available. And, and, and you talked about how the, uh, you know, the opportunity to actually meet with the group and whether it's top down or bottom up. Uh, I'm much more of a bottom up uh, uh, person. I don't think there are these huge networks of uh, recruiters. There's some, but there's not these huge networks all over the world, especially in the United States that, that are, you know, reaching their tentacles into places to, to try to recruit people. It's really about people who, who have who have radicalized, who've taken these ideas, and then want to have that opportunity to join. And what you're saying is that the Internet facilitates that uh, a meeting point. I, I'm thinking about the five uh, young men from uh, Virginia uh, who uh, went off to the, the, the FATA region of, 
Pakistan to try to join the Taliban. They really couldn't find them. Uh, uh, so in some ways, the, you know, the, the opportunity to, to join is not so easy in the non-virtual world, but as you said, it's, it's much easier in the virtual world. Yeah, and, and one point I want to add to that, uh, uh, and I agree with everything you said, is that, of course, over the past uh, couple of years, we had a very intensive debate about the concept of the so-called lone wolves. And uh, these are so-called lone operators who are not connected to any particular um, terrorist organization and who are supposedly by themselves. And I think just for the benefit of your students, I want to introduce another important distinction. Because what you find with a lot of these so-called lone wolves is that they were highly active on the internet. And uh, even though they were physically on their own, so they were alone, they did not subjectively feel lonely because they were actually very involved with other people, albeit online. They were part, a lot of these so-called lone wolves were part of online extremist communities even though they were physically on their own, sitting in their bedrooms, doing it, you know, without anyone surrounding them physically. And I think that's an important distinction because we're talking about lone wolves, but often, you know, these lone wolves did not feel that they are lonely. They did not experience loneliness because they felt that they were surrounded by other people, albeit online. And I think that's, that's what's really new. It's not that we're suddenly seeing a lot of people um, going off doing things on their own. The, 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 the incidence of truly socially isolated people committing acts of terrorism is still very, very small. Uh, but what we're seeing is with those so-called lone wolves is people essentially interacting with other people online and having virtual relationships uh, rather than being entirely Lonely or well, my sense is you think that the lone wolf phenomenon is uh, is is much rarer and and more difficult to achieve. The, the Unabomber kind of uh, example, someone who's truly truly isolated. It sounds yeah, like Unabomber, you think that's a pretty rare phenomenon. So so the Unabomber is a good example of someone who was a true lone wolf because he really was a recluse. He was socially isolated. He didn't didn't interact with anyone. Uh, he was doing this entirely on his own. I can think of maybe a couple of other exa contemporary examples. Uh, it's worth looking at the example of someone called Roshanara Chaudhry in the UK, a woman who was a student who became radicalized and then went off to stab her member of parliament because he voted for the Iraq war. She was someone that wasn't part of any Islamic societies, of any extremist group. She didn't interact with people online. She was online because she wanted to listen to lectures of Anwar Laki, but she didn't really join any forum. She didn't interact with people. She went off and did this on her own. She's a good example of an actual lone wolf. But most people that are often talked about as lone wolf, even the Boston bombers, even though clearly they were not on their own, um, even people like Zach Chesser and others, uh, or, or, um, or Samir Khan even, he was occasionally talked about as a lone wolf. I mean, he was anything but lonely. They were highly active on the internet. They were interacting with other people. In the case of the socially isolated lone wolf is much rarer than we often think. Let's talk for a moment as we head to the end about de-radicalization. Uh, I think uh, we often think about radicalization as almost like a virus uh, that somebody gets and uh, inexorably, uh, uh, the virus progresses and progresses, and they get very ill, and that's when they, they commit uh, violence. Uh, but de-radicalization can happen really uh, uh, at any time, and an individual who uh, uh, becomes uh, radicalized is, is not necessarily a, a radical for life. So what do we know about you know, de-radicalization, either uh, de-radicalization that just happens uh, because of the circumstances of individuals or de-radicalization that happens because of a, uh, an actual effort by others to uh, uh, move somebody from being a radical or an extremist uh, out of that uh, status. Yeah, so I mean it happens all the time as you indicated probably 99.9 .9 percent of people who 
played with radical extremist ideas do not embrace violence, so they stop at some at some point for some reason, and there's no inevitability about people becoming terrorists, and um, and so people stop for all kinds of reasons, and I mean if you think about the radicalization processes, if you wanted to engineer them, if you wanted to as, as a matter of policy bring them about, you would have to first of all go back to maybe these three elements and think about how you can address these three elements. And indeed, a lot of counter-radicalization or de-radicalization policies are about resolving the conflicts or the grievances that led someone perhaps to be open to extremist ideologies. They are about counter-messaging. They are about uh, debunking the ideological claims that are being made by extremists. And they are thirdly about getting people out of the group context that they used to be in. Because even if someone stopped believing in the cause, quite often they find it hard to leave a group that they considered to be friendly, they considered to be close to, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of de-radicalization programs where those have been executed are aimed at facilitating those three elements, solving the grievances, countering the message, and getting people into a new social context, maybe reestablishing links to the family. Establishing moderate ties so that you're not completely dependent on radical elements. So those are the three antidotes, if you want, to the radicalization process. But there are also other elements. We know from psychological research, for example, that by, by people like Tora Burgo, that people leave groups quite often because they feel disillusioned, because they realize that there is a gap between their claims and the reality that often leaders of these groups do not live up to the ideals of the group. And they often come to a disapprove, uh, for example, the violence that is uh, being used. For example, the fact that Al-Qaeda, in the particular case of Al-Qaeda, that Al-Qaeda kills more Muslims than, than Westerners or Jews or Crusaders or whatever are they consider to be legitimate targets. And so it's not only about countering those three elements of the radicalization process, it's also about leveraging all these doubts that people might have, these feelings of disillusionment and these potential problems that they encounter in terms of those gaps between claim and reality. And that's what counter-radicalization policy should be about. It should be about trying to, you know, facilitate um, all of these problems and doubts and, you know, these, these kind of ideas that people may have uh, that may lead them to leave a particular group. And now just to, you know, just addressing the second part of your question, uh, there are different methods that have been used. In a lot of Muslim majority countries, there are so-called de-radicalization programs. They are often based in prisons. Um, they are there to deal with people who've been either convicted or charged with terrorism-related crimes. There are so-called exit programs in a lot of Western European countries. They've been used with some success for white supremacists and neo-Nazis, and they are basically offering people who are part of these groups an opportunity to exit those groups. And then there are so-called intervention programs, which are aimed at people not at the point where they are already members of these groups, but where they are believed to be on the verge of joining these groups. And the idea of intervention programs is that you give people one last opportunity, maybe, um, to, to not go further and join a violent group. So there are different varieties of these programs. It's all very new, and uh, this is something where a lot of research uh, will probably be done in the coming years, and then probably something that will be very interesting and exciting. Well, uh, Peter Newman, you've been incredibly uh, generous uh, with your time. Is there uh, any uh, last word you want to uh, leave the students from all around the globe uh, taking this course, uh, a, a final uh, thought that you'd like to uh, leave them with? Well, it's just going back to the beginning, which is to say that, uh, that there's no holy grail of radicalization. There is not one formula. There is not one set recipe for that process. Really, you always have to look at how people radicalize and embrace extremist ideas 
in particular context at particular points in time. That's really important. Well, again, uh, thank you so much for your time. Uh, it's been a great discussion, and uh, uh, we're very grateful for you participating in this uh, mass online uh, course. Thank you thank for you the Peter. opportunity, David. Thank you.